Hello, Scott here, and welcome to another episode of A Poll from the Shelf. It's been a while since I've done one of these, but uh, what it is, generally speaking, is I go through my collection and look for a particular game that uh, I'm not too familiar with, haven't spent much time with, but I feel deserves to be pulled into the spotlight uh, and give it a bit more attention than I normally would in an unboxing video. Go beyond my first impressions and, uh, you know, kind of go through it with a bit more of a uh, detailed approach and, you know, see if this game is something that uh, you might be interested in, I might be interested in, or something that's worth passing along, you know, something uh, spreading the good word about this. Uh, a Pull from the Shelf is all about discovery. And we're going to be discovering together, hopefully, <laughs> is uh, uh, this game called Dragon Warriors. So for those not familiar with it, uh, Dragon Warriors is a game uh, that's been around for some time now. Uh, it was originally published in the UK around 1985 by Dave Morris and Oliver Johnson. And it's been around for a while, and it's got quite the pedigree, uh, you know, as far as mentioned through, uh, you know, RPG circles. Uh, but I feel it's one of those that people may know it by name, but they don't know the game. Um, you know, I, I can't speak for it uh, without, you know, going into it a bunch of research. But uh, my understanding is it, it was popular during the time uh, and has continued to live on through several different editions, uh, you know, currently with this one right here in front of me. And, um, you know, around, you know, current RPG circles, there's a bit of a resurgence. People swear by this game and uh, absolutely love it as, you know, an alternative to Dungeons and & Dragons and, and a, you know, different approach and a different look to fantasy role-playing games. Uh, with that, you know, it's titled as the classic British fantasy role-playing game, so there's going to be some... Um, uh, British sensibilities in here, I would imagine. And uh, likewise, um, it's something that, um, you know, it, it, I'm looking forward to paging through and giving it a bit of a look. Uh, I've been wanting to, you know, sit down with this for a while and get it to the game and hopefully potentially get it to the game table. I've had opportunities to play it online. Unfortunately, you know, time and avail availability tends to get in the way of that. So, you know, it's been shelved. And the whole purpose of this is, you know, to take a look at it and, you know, force myself <laughs> to spend some time with, with, you know, some of the many, many games that sit on my shelf that uh, don't get the attention they deserve. So <clears throat> without further ado, let's see if we can, uh, you know, go through this and uh, give it a bit of a, a detailed look and see what Dragon Warriors is all about. So if you'll excuse me. Oh, it is extremely hot here in California today. It's probably going to be approaching uh, 111 degrees today. And so the uh, uh, the AC is on, but that you know messes with my allergies, and so I've got a bit of a uh, I'm a bit dry today, like I usually am. Kind of seems like my allergies never go away. <laughs> so, oh, and one more thing to add: no forward-facing camera. Uh, the the camera that I use for uh, you know for that purpose is on my iPhone, and it runs off an app that allows you to use your your iPhone as a webcam. Uh, the app is kind of acting up, and I just don't feel like troubleshooting it. But you know it gives more attention to the game, <laughs> to the book itself, without seeing my, uh, uh, you know, the, the floating head uh, over here in the corner. Where are we at? Right there. Uh, you know, down there. There we are. Right over there. And, uh, you know, brings all the attention on the book. So let's take a look at this. So first off, just like to add, the cover's fantastic. I mean, the you know, most people's impression of books is, you know, first impression books are going to be the cover. And if the cover doesn't do a good job of drawing you into the game, most people aren't going to go past it. So uh, this right here pretty much explains what you have to look forward to. Uh, I, I know it's kind of, you know, the standard trope, you know, the, the multitude of different warriors going down into some sort of dungeon, but it's done very well. It, it does evoke a sense of adventure urgency, danger, and things you might expect within Dragon Warriors, so. All right, so there we are. Okay, so here we go. Here's a little quote here. So Dragon Warriors is a joy, a slick, fun system in a vivid fantasy world that keeps drawing me back year after year. It's been around since 1985. The gorgeous and long-awaited new edition is a rare second chance to get in on the best kept secret in gaming. Uh, Tim Harford, author of The Undercover Economist. Yeah. 
That's that, that is a definitely a good uh, recommendation there. And what do we have here? So oh, there's a little bit of bending there, but no big deal. I think this was a print from drive through I could be wrong. Um, anyways, so by Dave Morse, Oliver Johnson, uh, cover by John Hodgson, uh, well done. Uh, layout and publishing by James Wallace. And the interior artists, Andy Helpworth, John Hodgson, Scott Neal, Scott Purdy, and Eric Wilson. Uh, also maps by Andy Law, Russ Nicholson, and Fraser Payne, and the logo by Mark Choir. And all right, so, oh, so let's start off. Wow. Kind of flip that around a little bit. So the land in Dragon Warriors looks like the Lands of Legend. Uh, beautiful map. Beautiful, beautiful map. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's evocative of the classic Tolkien map uh, in, in the way that it's laid out, in the way that it's detailed, the, um, you know, the handwriting and whatnot that's utilized here. Oh, excuse me. And likewise, you know, um, makes you want to see the details of the world. There is nothing, absolutely nothing on this planet uh, like a good map for an RPG. Artwork, yes. Artwork, you know, definitely draws you in, uh, gives you expectations of the game, uh, evokes, a, uh, evokes a sense of wonder and, you know, and danger and, and other things that are involved in what you're going to experience. But a good map is always, always going to evoke a sense of, um, of exploration and, and, and wanderlust, as it should. It should make you want to see and explore the details of the world within. And this one absolutely nails it. <clears throat> okay. I hope I can make this through. Oh, boy. Okay. Excuse me. So, uh, it is, let's see here. The book itself is, you know, it's, it's not gigantic compared to some of the books coming out these days. But it's, it's a good 256 pages. Um, various chapters in here within the content. And within the contents, we've got chapter one. Fantasy Roleplay, Chapter 2, Creating a Character, Chapter 3, The Fighters, Chapter 4, The Wizards, Chapter 5, Assassins, Chapter 6, In the Beginning, Chapter 7, Into Adventure, Chapter 8, The Rules of Combat, Chapter 9, The Use of Magic, Chapter 10, The Book of Spells, Chapter 11, Games Mastering, and uh, Chapter 12, Rewards of Adventuring, Chapter 13, Items Weird and Wondrous, Chapter 14, The Lands of Legend, going on to describe the world you're adventuring in. Um, the Lore of Legend, Chapter 15. Chapter 16, Living in the Lands of Legend. Uh, chapter 17, Your Campaign Setting. Chapter 18, Travels and Hazards. Chapter 19, The Darkness Before Dawn, which I believe is, yes, it's an adventure, which is excellent. Uh, every core rulebook should have an adventure with it. And then chapter 20 on to the end going on with a variety of monsters. And I would imagine there's stats. So self-contained book. Uh, quite a bit of stuff in there. Uh, definitely a lot of material. I, I know that there are companion books uh, to, you know, and adventures that are associated with, uh, um, with Dragon Warriors. But, uh, yeah, I mean, just by looking at the, uh, uh, the co table of contents, you've got enough here to uh, definitely enjoy and, and have a good time with, uh, with the Dragon Warriors. So uh, let's see here. Wow, Dave, <laughs> that's quite the introduction here. Uh, let's see here. Should I go through? I'm not going to go through all of this. Let's see here. Um, I'll just read a bit of it. So as Dragon Warriors is coming up to its quarter century, it's now almost as venerable as those classic original role-playing games, Dungeons & Dragons, RuneQuest, Traveler, in whose company I was once a cheeky whippersnapper. Those who enjoy Dragon Warriors respond to something unique about it. What sets us, what sets us to wandering, what is the essence of Dragon Warriors? Um, most certainly the essence doesn't lie in armor bypass roles or other game mechanics. Indeed, the best legend campaigns we have played in have used the GURP system. Okay. And the rules mean nothing to those who live in the Dragon Warriors world, for whom mystic and warlock and sorcerer Sorry, my phone's blowing up. I'm going to set that aside. Um, are all interchangeable shorthand for a guy you really should steal well clear of. So is DW then defined by the world of legend? We think not. Some of the great role-playing games are completely identified with an entire fantasy sub-creation. Tecumel, Tecumel and Glorantha spring to mind. 
The world of legend, on the other hand, was always intended to be our world, only skewed. Some parts are closer to the 10th century, others to the 14th, but the point was always to create a backdrop that would be recognizably and and convincingly medieval. It was never about creating a place that was alien and strange. The familiarity of legend is what gives players freedom to create their own stories there. So, and he goes on to describe pretty much the creation, the transition, uh, you know, up to today. And so on and so forth. So, okay, so chapter one, fantasy role play. So Dragon Warriors is a fantasy role playing game, but what does that actually mean? Fantasy role-playing games, sometimes known as FRPs, RPGs, or FRPGs, are a way for a group of friends to share adventures in a magical world, the world of imagination. Suppose you decided to read the famous Minds of Moria sequence from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings to some friends. However, instead of sticking to the original plot, you involve your friends by assigning each of them a character in the story. One one person is thus playing the part or role of Gandalf, another is Frodo, and so on. They are deciding for themselves what to do. All you're doing is giving them the descriptions, what the mines look like, the monsters they meet, and treasures they find. You're in a 10-meter by a 5-meter chamber with a stone sarcophagus in the middle. Tunnels lead from the center of the east and west walls, and you've just come through the door to the south. As you are noting this down on your map, you, Carl, see a skeletal hand emerging from the sarcophagus. All you need to do then is add a set of adventure rules, and you would be playing an FRP game. So, So we go on to... I'm not going to say the the you know the typical you know what is a role playing game that that does seem to be included in a lot of games, but um, you know it, it's relatively succinct. <laughs> it's going to go into what is a games master here, uh, getting started, uh, which which I feel you know in, unless you know the the game seems to be ridiculously complicated and specifically designed for people who have a, a lot of experience with role playing games, including something like this it is always needed. I don't care what a lot of people say. You know, I know a lot of people kind of get get a little huff over, you know, saying the what's a role playing game. Well, I mean, I I am of the mindset that you never know, regardless of the popularity of the the greatest game in in the world, um, that it's not always going to be the first one. You just never know. So being prepared for something like that is always going to, you know, allow people to dive into your game if it just so happens to be the first one and if it's not people do what most people do they're going to go oh i know this crap and they're going to just go right over it okay <clears throat> so creating a character before you can begin your first dragon warriors game each player must create who will be his or her fantasy alter ego yep fair enough only ordinary six-sided dice are needed for this all right so we go on to a description of role playing and then the characteristics so Here we are. We'll skip over the role-playing aspect. So each character is initially defined by its scores in five characteristics. These are strength, reflexes, intelligence, psychic talent, and looks. Okay, so right off the bat, uh, you know, even though some of these are familiar uh, tropes for uh, abilities or characteristics in role-playing games, there's a couple on here where you're like, hmm, this is a bit different, especially psychic talent and looks. Excuse me. Although looks, of course, you know, falls into the aspect of charisma, but, uh, you know, uh, focusing specifically on looks is appearance. So so what else do we have? The value of each characteristic is rolled by throwing, by by rolling, by (laughs) throwing three six-sided dice, 3d6. And you can get anywhere from a 3 to 18, of course. So strength is measurement of your character's fitness and physical toughness. His reflexes score indicates his dexterity, agility, and speed of reactions. Intelligence shows how clever the character is. Psychic talent represents the, the character's basic ability to resist and, in some cases, use magic. And looks reflect his appearance and personal charm. This has no bearing on his adventuring skills, but you should clearly take into account when deciding how non player characters would react to him. Yep, fair enough. So, th- roll 3d6 for these five characteristics, and then record the scores in the appropriate boxes on his character sheet. And here's a, a sample of a blank character sheet. Simple, nice, doesn't look like it's going to involve a lot of, you know, rules-heavy aspect. Uh, the character sheet, you've got your abilities, you've got health points, uh, you've got things for magic, experience points, uh, your equipment, cash, magical attack defense score, magical defense score, uh, armor factor, self perception, evasion, attack, and defense. So, not a lot of, uh, 
you know, overly um, distracting crunch that, that seems to come with this game. But, uh, you know, we're at the beginning, so we'll see how it goes. <clears throat> So, uh, where were we? Each player will require a blank character sheet. Uh-huh. A full-size character sheet will be found at the back of the book. Yep. Uh, the luck of the dice means that sometimes the player will create a character with hopelessly bad scores, quite unsuited to life as an adventurer. The player may discard the character and roll up another. It is for you as a game master to decide whether a character is hopeless or not. As a guideline, we, we suggest you allow a player to discard any character with more than two characteristics below the average 9 to 12 range. All right. I mean, that's fair enough. I, yeah. I, I'm... You know, I fall into maybe the minority category of, you know, not having the best stats in the world could make for a, uh, a fun character, uh, especially a lot of role-playing opportunities with that character within the game, depending on what you're playing. But I can fully understand, you know, those who, who out the door have a concept and, you know, they're, they're chasing that, that die roll to, um, uh, to, you know, make that concept come to life and... You know, if a die roll doesn't meet that expectations, that concept can die on the vine. And yeah, I get it. I appreciate it. But, uh, you know, there, there's something to be said about an imperfect character in role-playing games, um, especially an imperfect party of characters that can lead to a lot of unexpected, exciting, and, and wonderful situations that are, uh, you know, are mem mem uh, that are definitely uh, memorable and can stay with you through, you know, your entire lifetime in the hobby. So... <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> All right, apologies. So, choosing a profession. In Dragon Warriors, there are seven professions to which an adventurer may belong. They are assassin, knight, barbarian, elementalist, sorcerer, mystic, and warlock. Interesting. Uh, players who have never played an RPG may find it easiest to play either a knight or barbarian. Uh, these two classes don't need to concern themselves with magic or stealth, just cold steel, mighty fuse, and valor. In any case, knights and barbarians will be by far the most common classes in most Dragon Warriors games. Indeed, there is no particular need to include the other classes at all for many adventures, and some campaigns will play out in their entirety with only these two. Okay, I mean, It's been around for a while, so I'm sure that observation holds. Uh, most parties, though, will have a balance, with perhaps the majority of knights and barbarians with the occasional mystic, sorcerer, elementalist, or warlock. Assassins are scarce indeed, and are often better fitted to use in solo adventures with only one player in the GM, or campaigns in which everyone plays an assassin. Ooh, I like that. <clears throat> okay, so knights are the best all-around fighters and dragon warriors. They're physically less robust than barbarians, and they're able to wear heavy armor without losing any of their combat skills. Barbarians are better in attack, but defensively less skillful than the knights. Their fighting style is fast and mobile, and heavy armor hampers them. They are able to go berserk in combat, making their attacks still more ferocious. Assassins are average in combat, but excel in sneak attacks, but then, but uh, when they can target an unwary opponent. They are by far the most stealthy character class in the game and gain a variety of other abilities that might seem magical to the unwary. And Okay, sorcerers are the most common and general magic-wielding character profession. If any of these rare individuals can be called common. They are relatively ineffective in mundane combat but can blast their foes with magic. They have a more varied repertoire of spells and elementalists and a little more raw, raw magical power than mystics. Uh, mystics use magic of a sort, but this is personal magic that comes from the mystic's mastery of his own mind rather than some external source. A mystic is good all-rounder, but not quite so magically strong as a sorcerer or elementalist, but reasonably capable in combat with a few other useful special, special abilities. Next, we have uh, elementalists or specialist magicians using the power of the natural elements to achieve their aims. Each elementalist magic is focused around a particular element, chosen from among fire, air, earth, water, and darkness. Like sorcerers, they tend not to be very skilled with conventional weapons such as swords and bows. Finally, warlocks combine magic with sword play. They can wear armor and use their spells to boost their combat abilities. They aren't quite so versatile in combat as knights or barbarians, but can be devastating when armed with their preferred weapons. Play as a, oh, I've, yeah, I've been skipping over the play as a warlock if you want to um, you know, follow a particular fantasy character you enjoy. Yeah, you can read that if you get this book. So, step three. So, we've, you've chosen your profession. The player can roll his character's health points. A character's health points 
or HP show how robust he is. Whenever the character takes a wound in combat, the wound is expressed as a number which comes off his, his hit point score. The character falls unconscious when his health point reaches zero and will die if he's ever re reduced to negative three or less. Lost, lost hit points can be recuperated by resting after the adventure as long as the character survives. A character's initial he health point score increases as he advances in rank. All right. Step four, the combat factors. All right. The character is now ready to determine his attack and defense scores. No further dice rolling is required. You've already made the necessary rolls and choices. Here are the basic scores. Uh, assassins, attack is 13, defense is 5. Barbarians, 14 and 6. Elementalists are 11 and 5. Knights are 13 and 7. Mystics are 12 and 6. Sorcerers are 11 and 5. And warlocks are 12 and 6. These are, in fact, the scores for an average character at the start of his career. If the player rolled above or below the average range in certain of his characteristics at step one, she may have to modify her attack and defense score slightly. See the effects table below. All right. Let's see here. Magical combat factors. Attack and, de attack and defense, as we shall see, represent the character's fighting prowess. In the Dragon Warrior's world, where magic is a reality, it follows that these combat factors must have, mag have a magical analog. So there's magical attack and magical defense. Uh, the basic magical defense score is 3 for assassins, knights, and barbarians, 4 for mystics and warlocks, and 5 for elementalists and sorcerers. The base score is modified if the character's intelligence and or psychic talent fall outside the average range. See the effects table below. Uh, elementalist sorcerers, mystics, and warlocks have a magical attack score. Uh, assassins, barbarians, and knights do not need a magical attack score. Okay. The basic magical attack score is 15 for elementalists and sorcerers, 14 for mystics, and 13 for warlocks. The basic score is modified if the character's intelligence or psychic talent are outside the average range. Yes, see below. All right, so let's look below. Effects of high and low characteristic scores on attack and defense. So uh, let's see here. So if you got a really low characteristic for strength, it's negative 2, 6 through 7, and 8 are... Uh, negative 1 for your attack, no effect for defense, 9 through 12 average, 13, 14, 15, plus 1 to attack, 16, 17, 18, plus 2 to attack, plus 1 to defense. And it carries on throughout the table, depending on your score, and apply the modifications as applicable. All right, so stealth and perception. Any character and monster, for that matter, may attempt to move around unnoticed, though assassins are the masters of this kind. The two character scores that allow the GM to determine um, the results of such activity. Oh, let me move that off. There we go. Sorry, there was a little little thing in the way. I didn't want to accidentally hit a button. But uh, uh, let's see. These two character scores that allow the GM to determine the results of such activity are stealth and perception. The scores vary accordingly to character's profession. Okay, knights and barbarians, elementalists. Sorcerers and warlocks, stealth score is 13. Perception score is 5 for mystics. And their enhanced awareness grants them higher scores. Stealth score is 14. Perception is 6. For assassins, a special training grants them excellent scores. Stealth score is 18. Perception score is 8. And I would imagine that's modified by the, the other table. Okay. Initial equipment. Every, new, every newly rolled character represents a young adventurer who has yet to acquire much practical experience. However, the character, character does, does not just leap into existence... He or she has, even at the lowliest first rank, rather more skill in the chosen field than the average man. So, let's see here. Basic items, further equipment, including missile weapons such as bow, may be purchased if the character has enough money. Equipment list on page 134 of chapter 12. Okay, good. Well, I mean, thank you. <laughs> Not a lot of things will, will say, hey, guess what? What I just referenced here is on another page in a different chapter. Um, you just go and find the equipment list. <clears throat> And step nine, rank. You begin at rank one, it looks like. Yes, the player should not, um, should not imagine that this makes their character total novices. A first rank knight or barbarian is a respectably skilled fighter, while not yet mighty heroes. They've been in a few battles and know how to use their weapon. And so on and so forth through the other ones. Finally, background. Now you know this, what this character can do. It's time to find out more about who they are and where they come from. This process is, is described in Chapter 6, in the beginning. All right, so we have a character sheet, encumbrance. This is going to describe encumbrance, and character creation summary. Very nice. So 
out the gate, I mean, you don't really have you, you don't have an idea what the rules are, but there's there's been a general breakdown of character creation, and uh, just to give you an, a basic idea of what to do with references uh, throughout here that uh, you know that, that affects your character creation, uh, telling you where to go later on in the book to provide this you know to, to provide your character with more details as you create it. So you do have a a general idea, but you know there's more de- more details involved prior to this. And I think it gives also give you, gives you an idea out the gate, you know, of your options and what you can or can't create, uh, you know, within the rules uh, suggested by by this game. And then we can then we move on into you know the description. I like that. I mean, there's all sorts of you know debates about you know how should you present a game in the beginning? Should it be lore? Should it be rules? Should it be character creation? So on and so forth. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've got opinions on that, you know, that, that swings several different ways. But to be fair, it's, it's all about presentation, uh, first and foremost. And then, you know, what you actually, you know, fill, uh, you know, the beginning chapters of your book with, uh, you know, kind of will swing either way depending on how it's presented. Uh, I like this presentation. Uh, you know, we've gone through the summary and then now we continue on in the chapters that goes into more details of, of each one of these um, character classes, so to speak. And then likewise, more details, you know, referencing within the summary, which you can always go back, you know, and find it very easily where to go after you start getting into the book. <clears throat> so we got chapter three. So the fighters. Uh, in the lands of legend, the world where the Dragon Warriors game is set, there are two main classes of people who earn their living by use of weapons. Knights and barbarians. Knights come from more advanced cultures. The ones we have learned how to craft sophisticated armor and weapons from refined metals. Depending on where they originate, they may be bound by a chivalric code that prescribes to whom they owe loyalty and service, when and how they can honorably kill an opponent, and so on. Some cultures have no code for their elite warriors, and some knights chose to abandon the code and live outside it, masterless, without loyalty or honor. Barbarians, are, by contrast, are far less sophisticated cultures through their ferocity and their skill, no less fearsome for all that. All right, so though culturally different, barbarians and knights are quite similar in game terms. Both are prim- primarily combatants, and both have trained in the arts of warfare and fighting. However, the knight will take a skilled and tactical approach to battle, while the barbarian relies on instincts and the innate savagery of his attack to carry the day. So, going on to carrying forward, we have knights. Knights represent the civilized warriors, warrior... Er, aristocracy of countries like Albion, Erworn, Char- Charbret, uh, Algandi, and Curlin. I'm sure I'm butchering those pronunciations, but, you know, bear with me. Uh, most player character knights will be landless, lordless wanderers, perhaps n- nominally of noble birth, but gaining respect through their deeds rather than their family name. All right, so special abilities of knights. So what do you get? What do you get when you become a knight? Uh, like all professions, knights have been trained in, this, in special abilities that raise them above common soldiers and militia members. Some of these abilities are unique to knights, while few are common to other professions. So what do you get? Uh, your special abilities are track, um, armor expert, ride warhorse, uh, disarm technique, and expert parry, main, main gauche, master bowman, quick draw, sword master, weapon skill. And goes on to explain those in detail. Uh, barbarians, on the other hand, uh, they have a number of special abilities, and they are Track, Berserk, Ride War Horse, and Blood Rage. Uh, so I'm curious, I mean, most, most of the knight's abilities speak for themselves, but, uh, you know, Berserk, depending on the type of barbarian that you're playing in within a particular game, may vary. So what, is, what does Berserk do for barbarian? Uh, you're able to make more powerful attacks at the cost of neglecting your defense. He may temporarily add one point to attack for each three points he subtracts from defense for that round. Interesting. That's 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 quite the uh, that's quite the exchange. But you know, you never know. <clears throat> that that's 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 the gamble you pay, or that's the gamble you do, and see how you pay. The house always wins. Where was I? Um, <laughs> blood rage is even more effective way than going berserk for calling upon the reserves of stamina and ferocity that resides in the depths of the human soul. Right, okay. At 8th rank, you may go into Blood Rage. Okay, uh, you know, color description, color description. Any normal mortal 
Uh, that is, an unranked character not belonging to an adventure profession whom he attacks is 80% likely to flee in terror. Even hardy adventures of first and second ranks have 25% of retreating. Uh, under Blood Rage, the Barbarian may not use missile weapons. Okay, He will always see close combat and attacking with an enhanced attack score equal to his normal attack plus his defense score. He loses all interesting interest in pairing, however, and his defense score goes temporarily to zero. The Sporak, who has attack 22 and defense 14 under nominal circumstances, becomes a killing machine with attack 36 and defense zero within the throes of Blood Rage. Interesting. Okay, and you feel no pain, whereas a character normally falls unconscious and reduces zero hit points. The Barbarian continues the fight until victorious or dead. Awesome. All right. So next up, we have Wizards. All right, we already know. We've got the general description, you know, of sorcerers, mystics, elementalists, and warlocks. And then it's kind of a difference between the two. So let's let's focus on their special abilities. <clears throat> so sorcerers in armor. There's nothing to stop a sorcerer wearing heavy armor, but it's not usually a good idea. Sorcerers are not trained to fight in armor, for one thing, and suffer combat penalties. Okay, so you need to be trained in armor. Uh, in this game, or you will not get its full benefit, or there will be penalties to other scores, I would imagine. Uh, more seriously, armor hampers the freedom of movement necessary if the sorcerer is to make accurate occult gestures. Few sorcerers weigh anything heavier than a suit of padded armor. All right, so your special abilities. Calligraphy, alchemy, artifice, and use of wands. Very cool. And then we go on with an alchemy list, depending what you can make by rank. Uh, artifice, I would imagine, is making magical items. And wands. And wand is a device which enables a sorcerer to concentrate his power efficiently in a small group of spells. Uh, artifice is the skill governing construction of wands also. Okay. Carrying on, the spell specific to each wand are as follows. Wand of Mastery. Command and Enslave, Wand of Flame, Dragon Breath, Nova and Firestorm, Wand of Healing, Wand of Energy, Wand of ne Necromancy, Wand of Summering, and Wand of War. Fantastic. Okay, Mystics. So Mystics seem more like, I mean, since they're utilizing their minds more and their, you know, the the mis they, their, you know, the magic comes from within them, with, uh, within them, um, that, uh, yeah, not psychics per se but you know it's it's kind of to, to give you a general idea you know of kind of what mystics might be within this game uh to be a mystic a character must have a psychic talent yeah i forget psychics and ability score so yeah it's it's not it's not too far of an assumption when 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 making that uh that comparison all right so let's see spell mastery uh new mystic spells available for mastery by rank so they have their special set of spells such as See Enchantment, Mind Cloak, Clairvoyance, Truth Sense, and Assessment. Uh, like Elements and Sorcerers, Mystics are not really in, at home in a heavy suit of armor. And special abilities they get. Premonition or Sixth Sense, ESP or Seventh Sense, Enchantment of Arms and Armor, and Adepthood. So what does Premonition give you? This ability to sense danger, okay? It must be applied to a specific object or location within five meters of the Mystic. Does not give any exact knowledge as to the form of danger. Uh, a door which registered as dangerous could be booby trapped, or it might have a vampire lurking on the other side. Great. Okay, so it's just a you know a red light. And the chance of perceiving danger will go up as you increase. All right, ESP. This is the ability to detect thoughts within a range of ten meters. Okay, fair enough. Self-explanatory. And higher percentages with rank. Uh, enchantment of arms and armor. I think that kind of speaks for itself, along with you know, what you can do and how long it takes. And Adepthood. Even in the magic world of Dragon Warriors, there is no power to match the inner mysteries of the human mind. Extraordinary abilities um, may be acquired by a mystic who reaches total spiritual mastery and becomes an adept. The mystic may first attempt to attain Adepthood when he reaches 8th rank. He must find some secluded spot where he can dwell in solitary con contemplation. Uh, each day he meditates. At the end of each week, he checks in to see if he's achieved adepthood. In game, in game terms, this is indicated by a roll of 96 to 100. Uh, let's see here. The adept mystic is spiritually at the pinnacle of perfection and physically not far from that. His reflexes and physical talent scores both increase to 18. 
His natural rate of healing from wounds is double, and he becomes immune to poison and disease. His serenity cannot be perturbed by external influences, rendering him involatile, invalid, inviolate. Hmm. Anyways, uh, against fright attacks. Immune. Immune. Uh, mind-controlling spells or possession by demons or spirits. Lastly, no enchanted weapon he forges will ever be flawed. With his every action guided by perfect wisdom, how could it be otherwise? Interesting. Now you know that that just opens up a world of role play for people who like to play dickheads. <laughs> uh, you know, nothing, nothing creates an ego like, uh, you know, not just being feeling like you're physically superior, mentally superior than, than everyone around you, but actually having the stats to prove it. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, elementalists. Uh, let's see here. Yep, these are the ones who, you know, they're focused on specific elements. I would imagine, yeah, fire, air, water, earth, and darkness. Okay. And there's a diagram to show their, um, uh, well, you know, the, the subsidiary elements around them. And so, special abilities, spell casting, raw power, elemental resistance, and, and wait, is that right? And basic equipment. Okay, now it just kind of skips over there. So, all right. So, some possible uses of raw elemental power. Okay. Oh, all right. So, raw elemental power. Even when capable of casting a spell or less effective or less effective at casting a spell for some reason, for example, due to wearing armor, being paralyzed, or otherwise being able... Okay, an, em an, elementalist, an elementalist, yes, can cause raw ele elemental power to surge from his body and into a foe. So, yeah. All right. So, you can't cast your spell. You're tied up. But you can still summon and control the raw elemental power around you, uh, you know, depending on what it is, fire, air, darkness, earth, water, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it takes to make Captain Planet. Uh, an elementalist can potentially use this raw elemental power for other more mundane purposes, as in the examples above. Okay, of course, you're resistant to the elements. Okay, each element... Oh, this is part of the special ability. So each elementalist requires one base, one article of basic equipment which he must carry about him at all times. These articles are the channels. Okay, so it's a channeling element or article. Uh, these, are, these are not part of the character's initial equipment and must be purchased or otherwise obtained in the course of the game. Oh. Without one of these items of basic equipment, the elementalist can only cast the spells at twice the normal spell point cost. Interesting. So examples. Earth, vine root staff. Air, Aeolian harp, oh, Aeolian harp, uh, water, crystal file, uh, pure spring water, fire, piece of vol volcanic rock, carried as an amulet, and darkness, an orb of darkness. Brr. These consist of two hemispheres that can only be unscrewed by mastering a complex system of arcane twists. Otherwise, it is unopenable, unopenable and indestructible. Huh. All right. Well, I have such sights to show you. Um, darkness elementalists, the other elements and their geas. Uh, darkness elementalists, like other elementalists, may use spells from two other categories of elements. Such spells, though, never have quite the same effect. Fair enough. All right, kind of even them out. Balance. All right, warlocks. Warlocks are fighter mages, masters of both sword and sorcery. Their ability to use magic does not equal... That of a sorcerer or a mystic, but is the counterbalance by the magic skill with weapon. Yes, as mentioned in the uh, summary. In the beginning, uh, minimum requirements. We ne we're not touching on that. Weapon groups. Uh, let's see here. So they can fall in the weapon groups. Categorize, for example, weapon group one, flail, mace, morning star. Uh, weapon group two, dagger, short sword, sword, halberd, staff, spear, so on. Simultaneous casting. Warlocks can power up for a battle faster than other magic-using professions can. Certain of their spells may be cast simultaneously with one another. Ooh. Allowing the warlock to cast two spells per round. That's cool. And warlocks in armor. Warlocks, like barbarians, can wear and fight anything up to mail without incurring a combat, combat factor penalty. Cool. All right. Special abilities. Wow, they got quite a bit of them. Uh, a praise enemy. Arrow cutting, fire, fight blind, unarmed combat, minor enchantment for weapons, armor, major enchantment for weapons and armor, and ride warhorse. Appraise enemy, is that what I, it sounds like it is? The skill enables the warlock to determine the profession and rank of a character just by watching him for a few moments. Cool. 
So you can find out, uh, you know, is, is this guy, you know, worth us going to toe, toe to toe with, or should we hightail it and skedaddle? Uh, arrow cutting, huh? This this talent allows the warlock to knock or catch arrows out of the air before they hit him. Cool. This calls for total concentration, so you can't so you cannot do it while spell casting in melee. Fair enough. Fighting blind, yep, that's you know fighting blind. Uh, unarmed combat. In order to select a skill, the wizard must have chosen weapon group uh, eight. So you can use a cudgel or unarmed combat. So kind of going for a. Uh, you know, a monkish, you know, a, you know, type uh, type character class here. A, a bit of a mixture of it. And then, of course, you can have minor enchantment for weapons and armor, major enchantment for weapons and armor, and uh, ride a war horse, which should be self-explanatory. Okay. And then I believe this is the last character class. We have assassins, the shadow warriors. Um, the assassin is one who makes a craft of murder, murder most foul. Uh, stealth, trickery, and poison are the tools of his trade. In the normal world, of course, the trade is rather unattractive one. Leaving aside the ethical question, eliminating, eliminating one important NPC after another would not make for in very interesting games after a while. Says you. <laughs> um, fortunately, the adventuring assassin of Dragon Warriors has more than one string to his bow. If he has no qualms about such work, he may indeed accept kill contract killings. But he also, but he also, but he may also at various times be a tomb robber, troubleshooter, an explorer, bodyguard, thief, freebooter, and even a hero, just like any other adventurer. All right, so <clears throat> let's see here. Anything else about before moving on? Knights in particular despise assassins. Yeah, I kind of, you know, it's got to be a foible to to this particular cast class one way or another uh, to kind of create that. Uh, that friendly animosity within a, you know, within an adventuring group. Okay, uh, assassins in armor. I assume that they prefer light armor. Yeah, there's negatives for wearing heavy armor. So special abilities, right. Okay, so this is going to, you know, get into a lot of things you might be familiar with and see if it has anything special added in. So we've got stealth, of course. Uh, we have combat techniques, armor piercing, Unarmored combat, throwing spikes, and shock attack. Ooh. Mental techniques, inner sense, memorize, and death vow. Okay. Uh, meditational techniques, hmm. alchemical techniques, skills, climb, disguise, pilfer, pick lock, and track. Excellent. So this is a very robust and, um, you know, not complicated, but, uh, you know, it's got some details to it, some oomph to it that uh, a lot of the other classes, you know, may not. So what are the, some of the things that, that I looked at? So stealth, self-explanatory. Uh, armor piercing, uh, extremely adept at striking for the weak point in the opponent's armor, and when attacking with a sword, staff, dagger, short sword, or throwing spike, you add plus one to your armor bypass roll. Okay, so so we're, we're seeing a lot of hints at the, the you know, ex rules explanations. Um, and, you know, once again, going back to what I, what I discussed, should the rules be presented before you go into any of the details of the game? Should it be lore first? Should it be character creation first, where it kind of you know does that in summary? Should it be flat out the rules? Um, but I mean, let's let's be perfectly honest. Unless this is your very 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 first role playing game, you know, when you see something like adds plus one to his armor bypass roll, you kind of have an idea of what that means. You know, you already know within the game that there's going to be a role. Uh, that's going to either successful, going to allow you to bypass armor, um, or if it's not, you're, you're not going to. So, you know, I know some people might go, well, I don't know what this means. There's no rules explaining it. Well, you know, sometimes the rules for most games, you know, if, they're, if they don't provide the full set of rules in the beginning, if they're described in one way or another, they're pretty much self-explanatory. So, <clears throat> carrying on. Shock attack. An assassin who successfully moves within three meters of an enemy without being noticed is then able to make a shock attack. The effect of this is automatic surprise. Okay, so surprise is a mechanic, but they've been nice enough to steer you to page 61. Excuse me. Additionally, if the assassin's rank is higher than that of a surprised opponent, he rolls d6 and consults the shock attack table. Okay, so shock attack table. Stunned. Okay, and you are then aghast. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, astonished and surprised. All right. Um, after and then after special effect from the above table lasts for a round, after which the victim may act normally. Okay. So you know, get get in that first hit and see if you can take someone down before they have a chance to you know react and regain their senses. Throwing spikes, sometimes called a throwing star. Right on. We got some ninja action in here. Uh, is an unusual weapon used almost exclusively by assassins. Once again, says who? <laughs> Ordinarily, is just a D2, comma, 2 weapon, uh, making it a D2 plus 1, comma, 1 in the hands of an assassin, uh, and explained above, and is therefore not especially effective against armor targets. It has the advantage an assassin can hurl up to 3. Sweet. Not necessarily all at the same opponent, though. Oh, wow. Fantastic. So yeah, this, this I can already I can already tell that that combat is definitely going to be action and hopefully uh, somewhat cinematic orientated. You know, with some of the things that I've seen in here. Um, all right, and throwing spikes throwing spikes are sometimes coated with poison. Damn straight they are. Um, all right, and there's a, there's the description there, which is also on page forty five, and likewise one twenty two. Assassins can make their own spikes and stars at material cost of 3 to 12 florins for 9. This takes the character two days. All right, so unarmed combat. Yes, so we already learned a bit about unarmed combat from Warlock's mental techniques. Huh, assassins cultivate the power of the mind, owning their, their thoughts like weapons. Okay, so they get that at the, as they go up. So inner sense. Assassins are agents of night and cultivate a psychic inner sense to enable them to operate in darkness. Whenever an assassin comes... Within one meter of a pit, obstacle, obstacle, being, or trap, even in pitch blackness, he will sense it if he rolls under his psychic talent on score on 1d20. So, is this a roll under game? I would, I would assume so. Maybe. Um, I don't think it would, it would be roll under for specific you know, talents, but we'll see. Uh, for more detailed activity in the dark, the assassin carries a hand lantern. This is a shuttered lamp held in the palm of his hand, allowing the assassin to release narrow, furtive beams of light just by pointing his fingers. That's cool. Huh, that's interesting. I mean, that's, that's kind of so simple. It's, I'm surprised I haven't seen that concept elsewhere. Hmm, okay. Memorize. Assassins are trained to recall information with almost photographic accuracy. The assassin has total short-term recall with a 100% chance of recollecting the full details of anything he has glanced at or overheard in the last month. God, I wish that was a, a real ability <laughs> that you can just get <laughs> by getting older. Crap, this seems to be the, the opposite of that. Anyways, uh, the chance of remembering something diminishes with the passage of time, decreasing by 10% for each month after the first until reaching a minimum of 10%. Cool. Death vow. Uh, Master Assassin gains the power of Death Vow, where, wherewith he can set himself to kill a given character, driving his single objective so forcefully into his subconscious mind that he becomes virtually a walking bomb. The time, the time taken to prepare the, prepare the mind for the Death Vow is one week. During this period, the Master Assassin reviews and absorbs everything he knows about the, about the intended target. If he subsequent, subsequently comes within three meters of the target at any time, the assassin immediately goes into a killing frenzy that lasts until he or the target is dead. This killing frenzy gives the assassin a bonus of plus 10 to attack and plus 2 on armor bypass rolls and on the damage inflicted with a successful hit. Also, instead of blacking out at zero hit points, he stays conscious and fighting until the moment of death. Cool. While on the trail of his victim, the master assassin is indifferent to hardship and discomfort. He needs neither food nor rest and covers twice the usual distance cross-country each day. An assassin can set himself only one such special target at a time. If he later decides to abort the mission, it, it will take him a further week to de-psych himself. After this, he can, if he wishes, select another victim. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. And then meditational techniques. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Dragon Warriors, assassins are able to use special meditation techniques to assimilate some of the powers of the mystic. Okay, cool. So light trance. Darkness trance, water trance, earth trance. Let's see here. Void trance, fire trance, wind trance, and Captain Planet trance when you combine them all. <clears throat> cool. Uh, then, of course, alchemical techniques. So they can obviously potions, 
Um, I would imagine poisons too. Uh, assassin's lotion. This is a normal poison. Okay, which can be coated on throwing spikes, the edge of the sword, etc. Cool. Smoke jar. Uh, this is a large clay jar pot, which functions exactly like a vial of smoke. All right. Flash pellets. When, when one of these pellets is hurled at the ground, it produces a blinding flare of light. Like I said, ninja. Uh, very cool. The skills of the assassin. Uh, you know, like, hey, this is, this is a, a detailed character here. He's complicated. Uh, breakfall. Assassins with breakfall skill can fall up to six meters without sustaining injury. Climbing. Assassins with a climbing skill carry special iron claws that fit over their gloves and boots for climbing purposes. This enables them to modify the usual climbing rules. I kind of like that because, I mean, you know, in, in other fantasy role-playing games, there's plenty that, that have the climbing skill. And the skill, you know, at a certain point says, you know, such and such thief or rogue or assassin or whatever has the ability to climb sheer walls just because they're awesome. Well, I, I, I do like the idea of having some other explanation other than, you know, you can climb straight up just because you're awesome. And, of course, it's explained here because they have special claws. Um that allows them to, to, to do this thing. Now, when an assassin climbs a wall or, or cliff, 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 cliff face, ugh, uh, he subtracts half his rank rounded down from the difficulty factor of climb. Okay, so, so he needs these to climb, but when he uses these particular climbing claws, uh, it allows him to essentially activate the special ability, and he does climb better depending on his rank. That makes sense and just, you know, I'm just awesome and I'm not Spider-Man, but I might as well be. Um, okay, jumping. An assassin who already has a climbing skill may select the jumping skill. Uh, an assassin who has jumping can leap up to scale an obstacle to scale any obstacle below three meters in height, given at least five meter as a run-up. Okay. Disguise. Uh, I'm sure that's self-explanatory. Probably helps you with stealth. Pilfer or in or pickpocket, but we'll call it pilfer. Uh, this is an ability to lift small items from a person while standing next to them. Um, we have pick lock. Doors and castles really have locks. Yep. And so I'm sure you want to open them up. Yep. And then we have, what do we have here? Oh, wow. Pick lock goes into a bit of details here. Let's see here. The base chance for picking lock is 30%. The assassin may pick the lock skill up to three times. The chance increases to 60 for the second skill lock and 90 for the third. That's excellent. You know, there's, you know, there's also a debate on when you try something, you do it once and it's done, and a lot of people will moan and groan, why can't I try it again? Well, of course you can try it again. It's just going to be more difficult this time. And then the third time's the charm where, you know, you can just say, hey, you've tried it three times, your lockpick breaks. Rather than, rather than just saying no, you can't. You tried it once, tough luck. And finally, we have track. Once again, should be self-explanatory. Um, and then we have an assassin at work detailed example. All right. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and stop it here. Um, and I'm, I'm going to, you know, cut this into, you know, probably two parts. Um, I, I don't know if I, I'll go through the full details of the book. Of course, there'll be lore in here to touch on. But um, we're, we're going on about, you know, 50 minutes or so here with this. And, yeah, so, so far... Um, what do you think? Uh, for me, uh, granted, yes, there's a lot of familiar uh, fantasy tropes in here, as they're going to be in most fantasy games. Uh, but it doesn't try too hard uh, to reinvent the wheel, which you will see in a lot of fantasy games. There's a lot of a lot of games out there that uh, you know promote you know we're not your boring old you know wizard fighter thief mage, <coughs> excuse me, or magic user, you know. But here's blah blah blah. blah. And it kind of seems a bit more, you know, like, you know, they're just trying way too hard to be different. And it just kind of falls flat on its face. You know, this, on the other hand, yeah, I mean, it's not, it's, it's wearing its fantasy trope on its sleeve. But there's enough in here, uh, you know, uh, minor details here and there to make it interesting enough uh, to want to try it. At least for me so far, um, you know, that's, that's, it's going to be different than, you know, your the most popular role-playing game in the world. Um, but, of course, that will be determined once we get take a look at the mechanics more so. But as far as the characters are concerned, yeah, this is not just your fighter, mage, thief, cleric-type classes. 
just using different dice. Uh, just, you know, um, from the beginning, the, the, the tropes are a little bit different. And, you know, and, you know as, as far as how they handle themselves within the game, uh, the rules will determine that. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's enough for me to, um, to definitely want to continue on. So hopefully you do, too. So, so thank you. Uh, this has been, um, you know, another poll from the shelf. Uh, my name is Scott. Uh, look forward to uh, part two of Dragon Warriors. You know, hopefully within, the, within a couple days, we shall see. Uh, we're a bit busy here at uh, at Castle Orcus Dorcas, so to speak, with uh, you know the real world setting in. Kids back in school, busy with work. Uh, you know, so, some of the kids have a bit of the sniffles. No COVID, thankfully. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, if you like to uh, catch me in 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 other things, definitely give a listen to Titter Pigs. Uh, the Tabletop RPG Podcast I do with Keith uh, from Rolling Boxcars. And, um, yeah, there we go. Well, we will see you soon with Dragon Warriors Part 2. Take care, everyone. Oh, damn it. There we are. There's the button. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>